it's hump day. Hump day! <laughs> it's hump day. Hump day! <laughs> Adam's not here. Okay, we're live. Hey, everybody. This is Bradley Benner with Semantic Mastery and uh, the whole crew with us today, except we've got somebody that's impersonating Adam. Uh, it's not really Adam. So <laughs> anyways, it's uh, Hump Day Hangouts episode 134. It's 4 p.m. on May 31st, 2017. We've got Chris, Hernan, Marco, and in Adam's place, we've got Roman, the yes. uh, man behind the curtain of SERP space. So what's up, everyone? Hey. We'll we'll go here. I'll, I'll direct this train wreck. I'll yeah. drive. <laughs> Chris, how are you doing, Chris? Doing good. Happy to be here. Um, it's finally warm and cozy in Austria. So yeah, that's great. That's Happy awesome. Happy everybody's here. Hernan, how are you doing, buddy? Hey guys, what's up? I just finished moving, so I'm on my new place uh, with new internet connection. So hopefully this will hold up. So I'm pretty excited to be here. I think behind Chris, bars. <laughs> You've got the stars or the stripes on, man. It looks like you moved into a prison. Yeah, probably. Mm. <laughs> Marco, how are you doing, buddy? Just fucking cold, man. Cold. <laughs> Very cold. Very fucking cold. Not just cold. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, there you go. So obviously, when it's not warm as usual, uh, Marco gets irritated. I'm not. I'm not in Costa Rica, dude. I'm not in Costa Rica. I can't wait. And then last but not least is uh, Roman, who is um, wearing the Adam mask at the moment. What's up, Roman? Ah, not too much. Been busy. Yeah? Yep. Well, we've got a ton of questions on the event page. Um, In case you don't see the event page, Roman, I can drop it to you in Slack. Do you have it by chance? Uh, No, I do not. Okay. Let me grab the URL and I'll send it over to you real fast. In Skype, I mean, I said Slack. I think. Sorry, guys, with Adam not here, I've got to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, a uh, couple of announcements. The only announcement that I know of um, is that we had a webinar with Bill Cousins last week uh, for Video Link Vortex, which is a really cool application that he created that um, basically automates the process of like siloing. YouTube channels. Um, and you can also do multi-channel silos. So you can actually silo from one channel to another, as well as automate the process of setting up playlist silos. Uh, most of you guys should already have YouTube silo Academy. If not, go check it out. It's only $7. And the process that, you know, the method that we teach in that works really, really well, uh, for building silos into YouTube channels using playlists. And it's super powerful. But it's very, very time consuming. I mean, I use it forever. I use silos every time I do a YouTube SEO project. I always end up using playlists and then build out the silos. But the actual interlinking between the videos within the silo or within the playlist, it's very time consuming. It's a pain in the ass. And if you're doing something like uh, the mono silo structure where you're linking from one video to the next, then from that one to the next one to create like a a, a daisy chain, that um, can be confusing, especially if you've got you know, a handful of videos or, or pl- more in a, in a playlist. So typically what I what I have done in the past is just set up a, a spreadsheet and put in the URLs in the order in which I'm going to link from one to the next to the next, because otherwise, if you don't kind of plan it out ahead of time, it becomes a pain in the ass. You end up missing a link somewhere. And then you have to go back through and check it all. It's a real, it's just a time consuming um, process. So uh, Bill Cousins created Video Link Vortex, which is an app that actually automates all of that stuff with just a couple of clicks of a mouse. Very, very cool uh, application. And we did a webinar last week. I'm going to send or drop the um, message into the page now, guys, if you want to go check it out. Also, he just issued a uh, discount, $50 discount coupon. So I can already hear it already. A few people that might have already purchased it are going to say, well, I didn't get the discount. Well, just reach out to support. We'll work something out. Um, give you a $50 credit towards something else or whatever. We'll, we'll figure something out. Um, okay. But he just issued this coupon, guys. So I'm going to drop this. Guys, just go check out the webinar that we did with them. You can see if it's for you. Um, you don't have to buy it. But obviously, if, uh, if you're doing playlist silos and you want to save time, this is definitely the app. I mean, forget the – and this is what I said in the webinar in case you guys see it. Even if um, – you know, there's an SEO benefit for doing it, but 
put that aside, I mean, the whole reason why we do that is because of the SEO benefit, but the amount of time that you'll save from having to do this manually is totally worth the price in my opinion, because if I, if, if I could, <laughs> if I could actually uh, account up all the time that I've spent building out silos and doing that interlinking process, man, it's, um, I should be ashamed of myself because I should have had a VA doing that stuff anyway. So anyway, go check it out. Besides that, do we have any other announcements or not? Anybody? I think we should be good, Bradley. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to grab the screen and let's get into it then. We've got a lot of questions. Oh, one last thing. We've got the Syndication Academy update webinar number 12 uh, immediately following this and got some pretty cool stuff that I want to show today that I'm going to share, guys. Um, I've spent the last three hours actually working on uh, some really cool stuff. So I'm going to share that with you guys, um, Syndication Academy members at 5 p.m. And it'll be about a 40, 45 minute webinar. So see you guys on that. And you can find the link to that, by the way, in the Facebook group in the events tab. All right. All right. Here we go. Cool. Can you guys can see, see it? it? Yeah, we can see you now. Okay. All righty. Let's get into this. We got a lot of questions. So. Uh, Gurpreet, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Forgive me if I did not. What time to give your clients to see results on low average and high authority search results? Um, you know, it depends most of the time for low and average. Um, well, for low, I, I, you know, I always mention 90 days at least before we'll start to see any significant movement. And usually for low competition within 90 days, I can, I can rank it, right? Um, get in at least the three pack or something, uh, depending on what it is. For low competition, though, usually within 90 days, it's it's a slam dunk. It's not a problem. But I always say 90 days because I, I need to give – don't – it's better to give yourself more buffer room um, and then over-deliver. Uh, over deliver. In other words, if you give yourself, like, say it's going to be three or four months, but you know you can do it in six weeks, don't say I'm going to do it in six or eight weeks because then what happens if it's a particularly difficult – um, project, you know, for whatever reason. And remember, there's a random ranking factor. So because of that, it's better off, you're, in my opinion, you're better off to um, give yourself more leeway, more time. And then uh, that way, if you perform well, if, if the project goes well and you get it done much faster, then that will just impress the client. You know what I mean? So for low, low and average, I usually say about 90 days before you'll see any significant improvement. Um, and in high authority stuff, I always mention at least six months. If it, if it's, if it's tough or stiff competition, and I'm talking about on local level guys, strictly on a local level, but I usually say it's going to be, you know, six months before we see any significant movement, we can start target. And I always mention what, you know, we can target longer tail keywords and start getting traffic from those. We can target, for example, local areas. If it's like service area and stuff like that, we can target neighborhoods or, uh, you know, districts and things like that so that we can catch some of the long tail, lower competition traffic while we build on working towards the higher competition traffic sources. But the other thing is, remember, I always recommend, um, especially with SEO projects now for any new client, I always recommend starting off with a, a mix of both AdWords and SEO so that they can get results immediately from the PPC traffic while you're working on the SEO guys. Because in my opinion, now um, now that I know AdWords, which I avoided for many, many years, but now that I know it, I like the fact that I can produce results immediately for a client, like literally within a week. I can, I can have leads coming in for the client uh, while I'm working on the SEO. So I like to factor that into my proposals now and just state right up front that a portion of whatever their monthly fee is going to be going towards AdWords while I work on the SEO because there's a lag time between the start date of the SEO project and when it starts to produce results. And in the meantime, I want to backfill that that time with uh, leads. And the only way that I know how to do that effect, very efficiently is with AdWords. And so, uh, you know, it'll be front end heavy now, the proposals, when I go to do any sort of new take on new client, I'll do a proposal for both setup and monthly uh, services, as well as an AdWords budget, even if it's a small budget to begin with, I, rec I always uh, add that to the proposal so that I and explain exactly what I just explained to you. So what do you guys have? Um, what's your opinion on all that? Mm. Well, it's actually a, a good question. Like, first off, there's the whole thing of managing expectations, right? If you're doing SEO, uh, the client needs to have 
really clear in mind that uh, there's faster ways of getting traffic while SEO kicks in, as you were correctly saying, Bradley. So you need to manage expectation correctly. I think that's step number one. And then I always say that it all depends. Like I don't base my SEO campaigns for clients when I do them on uh, rankings, but rather on visitors, exposure, traffic, those kind of things, and sales at the end of the day, but that's another story. So, because I don't like to promise stuff that I cannot control, like Google's, uh, you know, Google's algorithm, but there's some things that we can control, which is the amount of keywords that you can rank the client for, like meaning if you can set up new keywords, and uh, new content, long, long tails, et cetera, et cetera, that's something that you can control. What you cannot control is where the client is going to land on the search results, right? So I also like to, I always like to manage expectations from the get go so that, uh, and I totally agree with Bradley in terms of, you know, give yourself some time. If you know that this is going to be an easy project, give yourself some, some time so that you can actually, you know, exceed expectations and say, yeah, this guy promised me like, I don't know, two months, but in three weeks we were already ranking. Okay. So you have a card up your sleeve if you I, I would add that you you trickle like don't just if if you have a budget and it's a set budget and it's a low budget then you start trickling in the traffic I like I never promise that I am going to to, to put them anywhere in the search results I, the, the conversation never happens and if if it gets brought up uh, I, I move it to results that they're going to see it in their bottom line rather than oh you're going to rank for this keyword and that keyword and you're going to get this many visitors and all this other crap that you have no control over what what you can do is just like it has been said you can turn on ads you can go to facebook you can go to uh you can even go to bing depending on on the niche and start doing ads and start delivering some leads while the, everything else kicks in but i mean you, you never ever ever bring search results and keyword placement into the conversation or you're going to be screwed if, if you don't deliver yep i agree roman your take um i agree with hernan you know i really really like what he said about expectations you know if you think it's going to take you three months to rank something and you set the expectations for six months, it gives you a lot of leeway. Yep. Um, and you're not going to have a pissed off client as long as you're managing expectations. So that's, that's, right. that's a really important thing. If you set your expectations to three months and something happens and you can't deliver in three months, well, you're in trouble. And that's, you know, in my experience with client work, that's a really, really important is expectations. Yep. I totally agree because that's the thing, guys. Uh, and, you know, the, the problem, I, I was chatting with one of our mastermind members earlier today, in fact, um, who just lost a client that was that had totally unrealistic expectations. And he approached me, my, the, the mastermind member, um, to ask me for some help uh, and some guidance on how to handle these two different clients that he's having some issues with. And one of them, uh, and this was just last week, and then one of them, and I'm not going to reveal your name, buddy, so don't don't, don't worry. Uh, one one of them that he was talking to me about last week just had um, actually just fired him or whatever, let him go. And he told me that to just this morning. I, I read the email that he replied to me and mentioned that. And I said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that you lost the client. That sucks. But on, on the other side of it, her expectations were completely unrealistic. And she would have been a shitty client uh, no matter what you did for her. And he came back and said, I have to agree. You know, basically the, you're right. She, she was a shitty client and she would continue to be no matter what you bend over backwards, jump through hoops. Those types of clients are never going to be happy. And so, and that's, and that's in part because of what Roman and, and Hernan were both mentioning about setting expectations, guys, you have to set expectations right up front. And that's the problem. If you start to set expectations up front and you start catching resistance to your expectations or people want to speed the process, you're going to have to let them go because even if you talk them in at that moment into hiring you for or, or purchasing your services, it's going to be just a matter of days or weeks before they start to resent 
the, the purchase anyways, because they were impatient initially, but yet you talked them into it. And that's, I'm reading this book right now, guys. Um, well, I've read it once. I'm going through it a second time now. In fact, I'll probably reread it several times because it's so damn good. But it's uh, for anybody that's doing client work, go get Bill. I think his name is Bill Good. Hot Prospects is the name of the book. You can buy it on Kindle for 10 bucks. Um, it's called by Bill Good, Hot Prospects. Wayne Clayton, one of our mastermind members, pointed that out to us. And one of the mastermind members where he was a guest presenter uh, about a month or two ago. And I picked up the book and started going through it. And it's fabulous. And one of the things that Bill Good teaches within that, uh, within within the book is to to get right off the bat, eliminate any um, what he calls pits or uh, just just flat out, you know, jerks <laughs> like people, people that are going to be difficult. Like you don't want to try in the old traditional way of selling is to always overcome objections. And when somebody says no, it's just because you haven't been you haven't provided the the proper rebuttal, you know, that kind of stuff. That's it. I like Bill's Bill Goods approach from Hot Prospects, which is. Don't do that. Like if somebody gives you resistance, cut them, knock them off the list, man. Go, go for the, go right for the next potential prospect because those people, even if you convince them to purchase your services or to hire you or whatever, they're never going to be satisfied and it's going to be a pain in your ass. And trust me, I've done it many, many times during the course of my career. And, uh, and I'm sure most of, uh, most of those on this webinar now have done the same thing where they've, followed the dollar instead of their gut, either gut feeling, and it's caused them a ton of heartburn or, 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 or a headache. And, and I, so I, again, I totally recommend that you guys, um, you know, set expectations right up front. And that's also a great way to uh, qualify or disqualify a potential prospect for, for services. Because if during the time that you're trying to set expectations, you start to catch resistance, doesn't mean cut and run right off the bat, because you can still salvage a good um, sale at that point, if it's just like a, you know, a, a minor, um, issue or obstacle that can be overcome. But when it gets to like expectations, especially if you see, if you can tell that or feel that they're impatient and that kind of stuff, guys, I'm telling you the best thing to do is walk away and go find another prospect. Um, you know, some will, some won't. So what someone's waiting, right? By the way, can we send him a, a shirt? A hat or, or a book for best one sentence quest, question asked Ever. in in Hump Day, yeah. Because we, we're going on and on. This, this is awesome, man. That's a great question. Yeah, it was a good question. Uh, yeah, some Hernan or somebody, can you take a note of that and we'll uh we'll send Gerpreet something. We'll sure. reach out to him. Awesome. Okay, Michael Boone's up. We'll try to roll through the next one faster. Sorry, guys, but I think it's a great question. When allowing service space to create your single tier one syndication, do they create and set up each account? Yes, Michael, they do. Or would I have to do that? No, we, we set all of the accounts up. And if they do, can I supply the accounts that I want to use to, that have already created? Uh, Roman, that's a great question. That's a custom order. Can we do that? If so, what's the surcharge, all that? Um, absolutely. We uh, we actually don't charge for it. So they can, uh, they can include it. There's a uh, field right before the end of the form that they fill out that asks them about existing accounts. Uh, there's kind of two things to keep in mind with it. The first one is that you can submit um, URLs to add into it that we don't necessarily use for the IFTTT syndication aspect, but we can link to. And then there's also the, the other piece, which is the IFTTT syndication. If you're wanting to syndicate um, to that individual property, then we're going to need the username and password for it. And if not, then you can just include it for a linking purpose. Yeah, for interlinking between profiles, you mean? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, there you go, Michael. That's awesome. It's nice to have you on here, Roman, for questions like that, because I would have fumbled through it and been wrong with my answer. So, uh, okay, cool, Michael. Thanks. Uh, next is long. Is, this is a pretty long question, but um, I read through it already, guys. I'm not going to read line for line through here. I'm just going to answer it. You guys all have access to the event page. You can read it yourself. But, Wong, what I want to tell you right off the bat is don't ever try to deceive when you set up lead gen properties, be honest about what the purpose of the site is. I don't, I don't lie. Period, guys. To to uh, prospects or uh, contractors, service providers, none of that, because it will bite you in the ass. Period. At some point, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass. So just don't do it. Don't lie. Be honest. So when you're approaching a potential service provider that you want to sell leads to, 
then just be right honest right off the bat. Say, look, you know, I, I run. Uh, you can say I'm run, run a marketing business or whatever, or I'm studying marketing or whatever you want, and say I've got this uh, site that I built, and it's generating leads. It's a, a site that I built. It's in your industry. Uh, it's in your town. It's in your, you know, it, it, whatever. It's, it, and it's it's generating leads for these keywords, you know, or or for people looking for your services. You don't want to say generating leads for these keywords because that. A contractor or service provider, I don't give a shit about any of that. All they care about is whether or not, if you've got leads or not, period. And just say, I've got leads coming in from a, a, a you know a website that I built that's generating phone calls and I need somebody to service these leads. I'm a marketer. I set this up as a test or a case study. And, uh, and now I've got these leads. I need somebody to service them. Are you interested? And just like I said at the beginning of the, uh, excuse me, a few moments ago when I was talking about Bill Good's book, Hot Prospects, um, when you start contacting, the, yeah, the, the trick here is well, there's, a, there's a few variables for your campaign, right? Your, your prospecting campaign, there's variables, right? One of which would be your list itself. So who are you prospecting to, right? So, you know, I'm sure if it's a lead gen site that's ranked for a handful of keywords in a particular city, you're going to have a limited list of people that you can actually um, contact for that. But first, make sure you've got a good list or, or a list that's highly targeted so people that would be specifically looking and try to get a comprehensive list if possible. I like to hire a virtual assistant to scrape contacts um, or leads for a prospecting campaign. However, um, I just recently started lead, using Lead Kahuna again because it's uh, David Sprague just updated to the version 4.0 and, um, and it's actually working really, really well. So, you know, that, there's plenty of scraping tools out there that you can use. But the second variable would be your, you know, what, what your script is or what your dialogue is when you're pitching or talking to them. And number one, like I said, don't, don't lie or I don't ever recommend that. Just be honest. And in that, during that period, when you get past the gatekeeper and you're talking to the owner and you start to be honest, if they're un, unhappy with it or, or um, as you say, they just, you didn't get, you didn't find much success. Um, so, so what? Find somebody else. Go to the next person on the list. You know, and you'll get better at this as you uh, continue to prospect. What I, the reason why I like to do video email or or emails, but with a um, specifically video emails, um, they they tend to work better as far as getting a response. But the reason why I like to use that uh, process is because with email tracking. I can see when anybody opens the email. So I can get notified via email and or text um, when somebody opens an email. And then I can also set up notifications with my email tracking to where if somebody clicks a link within the email, it will notify me, hey, not only did they open the email, but they also clicked a link. It will show me the duration, it, how long they had the email open. It will show me if, I, if they forwarded it. It will show me how many times they opened it. So it gives me all these analytics so that I can do cold emailing to a list of let's say a hundred prospects, and I can see that out of the hundred emails, uh, you know, thirty-two of them got opened, and out of thirty-two of them, eight people clicked the link, which means they went to and saw my video where I explain what I've got, and and then out of those, sometimes you'll see people forward it to like two other people in their same company with the same you know uh, root email address or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And and that those so why I like to use video email guys or emails period is because I can see activity level based upon analytics that tell me who's the most interested so that when I go to make that phone call, it's not a cold call, it's a warm call. They already know who I am, they know what I have to offer and because of the engagement that I saw through the email analytics, I know that they are interested whether they say so or not. And so that then I'm, I'm, I don't like cold calling period guys, I freaking hate it. So if I'm going to call, I want to know that there was at least a level of interest in my offer and I can do that with email. And I know you can't do that here. So you're going to be, uh, have a, a tougher, um, a tougher job ahead of you Wong. But again, I, I wouldn't lie, be honest, go through the list. You'll get better at your pitch. Um, when you start talking to them through practice and repetition, that's really the only thing I can recommend. If anybody else has a suggestion, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, I, I would add, don't sell. Don't go in with the mindset, I am going to sell this guy something because, I mean, that's what everybody else does. They, they hear this all day, every day. They get emails. You, you kind of have to set yourself apart. Now, if you're past the gatekeeper and you're talking to the guy, the way that, or, or to the lady, whoever it is that your prospect is, 
the only way that, that, that you're going to sell this person is if this person likes you. So the one thing that, that I recommend to everyone when I do consultation for this is, is you have to work on likability. Mm-hmm. How likable are you on the phone or in person when you're addressing the person? How comfortable are you? Are you making them feel comfortable? Because you can see it in their body language or you can hear it in, in their tone on the telephone. And so for, forget selling, forget that you're selling these, forget all that and work on reaching this person at a personal level where, the, you know, there's some interaction, there's some likability, and you're, you're, you're more likely to get your message across once that person has opened up than if you just say, hey, I got some leads that I want to sell to you, which yeah. doesn't work. Anyone else, guys? I think you guys nail it pretty much. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, sorry. No, no, go I ahead, think, Roman. I think Marco hit that one really well. There is, you know, the person has to like you. You can have the, the best offer in the world um, presenting them, but if they don't like you, they're not going to buy. It's rapport. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. I mean, yeah. it's it's ridiculously important. The other thing is also making sure that you're speaking the language of the business owner, the words right. that you're using. At some Their point, you might. vocabulary, you mean. Exactly. So, you know, when you're talking to a business owner, what do they care about? They care about their bottom line. They care about their ROI. They care about how much money they're making. So those are the things when you're developing your pitch or what you're talking with the client, you need to be thinking about that as well. Yeah. And the last part of that is... Um, you know, as far as uh, developing rapport, you, you know, just uh, that's part of the reason why I like using video email again, guys, is because if they open the email and then they click through the video, they get to meet me, so to speak. Right. They get to know who I am because I I will typically do a screencast video where I'm explaining, uh, you know, it, it depends. I've done v- many, many different ways, but I've done screencast videos where I might do like a, a site audit or something, or I'll do like a, v- a VSL video sales letter where it's just text across the screen and I'm reading it. Sometimes I'll do that with a combination of the video, uh, you know, like the webcam with the webcam showing in the lower corner of the video or something like that so that they get a chance to meet me. I've also done just like headshots, talking heads, you know, where I'm talking into the camera. Um, and I've had, a, I've had different success levels with different methods, but again, it's about testing. And like Hernan just said, uh, likability and rapport is important. And that's why I like using the video email because you kind of build rapport even through a video because they get, they kind of get to know you uh, a little bit. So when you do call, it's not a straight cold call. It's more of a warm call. And so I get better results that way. So, and, and, and again, I know Wong, Wong isn't, doesn't really have much of that option, but that's for everybody else. All right. Uh, the second part is this. Do you offer a free amount of leads to the client before start charging them? Yes, I've done that many, many times because um, a lot of the times people don't think it's real until you can provide them with results. And so I'll send them, you know, three leads, four leads. It depends on what the leads are. Obviously, real high dollar stuff. I wouldn't send them more than one or two. Um, but oftentimes for like stuff that has smaller margins, I might send them three to five leads. Um, and I, I like to send them in real time. Like, in other words, I don't like to send them leads. Like if I, if I've had phone calls over the last week and I've accrued three or four or five leads in the last week, I don't like to send them those. Cause those are stale leads at that point. What I like to do is once I've got the agreement that they're cool with me sending them a few leads as I, from that point forward, any new lead that comes in to, uh, I'll send to them up until the number that I promised, if that makes sense. And then always follow up with them on the leads that you send them. If you're going to send them a free lead, follow up with them after sending it to them, like within an hour or two hours or what, depending on what the sales cycle is for that particular um, type of business. But you want to follow up with them after shortly after sending them a lead to find out if they followed up with the lead. Because if they're not following up with the lead, then there's no reason for you to continue talking to them or sending them any other leads. Does that make sense? So if you're going to send free leads, guys, it's really important to follow up on it to make sure that they got it, number one. Number two, that they're following up on the leads so that, that that's what will sell them, by the way. Because if you can tell them that, uh, you know, if you're following up and you find out like, hey, did you follow up that lead? Yeah, we did. And we actually got the job and blah, blah, blah. Or, or we scheduled an estimate, you know, that kind of stuff. You say, hey, look, I've got another one coming. Um, you know, t- I'll send you one more or two more or whatever. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about um, compensation if it's a good fit going forward. So... All right, Alexander's next. He says, thanks for the always awesome content. You're welcome. I'll plus one that. My question is about maps. I have a client dentist that has a GMB verified 
uh, okay, local page, I guess, his real place. It was showing for the terms like orthodontist and some others, but never for dentist. Then I deleted other categories like orthodontist and left only dentist. Now don't show t don't show for orthodontist either. I click on the arrow to see more places. And even going on page three of map results, it isn't there. It appears only if I search for the name. Should I delete this one and start another GMB? No. I would go back. I mean, that I'm having a lot of issues with Google My Business stuff right now as well, Alexander. Some some funky stuff. Um, I've had a couple listings that have recently just been filtered out, and I'm not sure why. And there's a way to test for filtering um, where if you go to the Google My Business and Instead of just clicking on the, or excuse me, if you go to Google Maps and you search for your keyword where your uh, local page should be ranking for or should be at least in the results, might not be you know ranking in the top, but it should be in the results somewhere, <clears throat> in the maps, the expanded maps, guys. I'm not talking about universal search. I'm talking about when you go to maps. And if you don't see it when it should be there on the pages that are listed, so like page one and you can go down and hit page two. If you go back and do it again, start over, and then you click the plus button or the minus button to zoom in or to zoom out, if you see your listing appear all of a sudden after clicking the plus button or the minus button, if you see your, your listing appear in the maps search results, um, then it means that Google has applied some sort of filter to it. And that's why they're filtering it out from the, uh, the search results. And, um, and I don't know how to fix that yet, but I've had a couple listings recently that that's happened to. And I'm working on some different methods, uh, testing different methods to see if I can get them to, to that filter lifted. And I'm not sure what causes that or how to resolve that. If somebody else knows and they want to share it with me, by all means, PM me. <laughs> Let me know. But um, as far I as would, that, I'll, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would add a question. C can you get Alexander to the location or, or close to, lo to the location? where the dentist is listed and do a search because I mean, the, the only way to be able to tell is actually the IP, how close you are, because we all know that local is now going to proximity. Yeah. And so that, that would be one of the ways and I wouldn't eliminate it. I would just go back, put it the way it was so that at least it appears for orthodontist or whatever else. And <laughs> Isn't is is he in RYS Academy? No, I don't right. think he is. Because I would just tell him to to I, I would load up uh, a drive stack with dentist keywords with dentist relevancy and, and, and shoot it shoot the loop, as I call it. Right? You close the loop, and that that should take care of any and all issues that he's having with the map. But that, yeah, that's I mean. The, the first way would be go and, and you have to do a local search to see. That's the only way. And you mean you mean local like like actually be in that location and do a search from like a mobile device, for example. Exactly. Because right. that's what mostly most people do. Right. They go. They need a dentist. They go to their uh, smartphone. They, they, they look. At, I need a dentist near me or a dentist. Uh, Same dentist name. Close by. Dennis yep. in yeah whatever but if you're not at the IP if you're in a desktop somewhere else you're not going to get the same results there's absolutely no way because it's, we're talking about two different algos right two different algorithms and now, now and now everything going mobile and then you're triggering just just different things and and I I wouldn't say it's it's the cure all but one of the ways to try to fix it is RYS relevancy that's how I would do it. Yeah. And by the way, there's a tool in AdWords. You can go to, uh, you know, create a free AdWords account and then use the ad diagnosis and preview tool to actually set location uh, for Google search and then search for your key phrase. Now, it doesn't allow you to expand on the search results at all. So all it will show is the first page search results. And like if it pulls a three pack, it'll show the three pack. You won't be able to click more results. But that's something else that you could uh, look at. I, I when I first started learning AdWords uh, last year, really, um, I started. You know, I was using the Ad Preview and Diagnostic tool in one of the locations that I had set up a uh, AdWords funnel for a lead gen property, and um, I had already had a maps listing that had been. It never showed in the three. Pa well, it didn't show in the three pack when I was searching for from my home location, but the 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 city that I was searching was 
you know, and it, it was 30, 40 miles away from where I live. Okay. So when I would search for it from my desktop, it would never show in a three pack. And so I just assumed that it wasn't ranking, but I was getting leads or, you know, it was a lead gen property. So uh, it was a tree service site. And so we were getting leads from it though. And so I, w I always wondered, you know, what was going on with that, but I never really cared too much um, because it was really just um, kind of a case study project anyways. But when I started doing AdWords and I was in that particular city with that, or setting that geolocation for some search terms I was searching for, lo and behold, the listing popped up and it was in the three pack. And so it, like what Marco was saying, there's absolutely a difference between what was shown to me being in a different location searching from my desktop and what was shown to uh, somebody that's located in that city. The, the search results were absolutely different, especially in the in the, the local results, the, the, the maps results. And so uh, that's why I was getting leads. Now it's funny because now if I search from um, where I'm at in my location and, and it's still, it's, it shows in the maps pack. So I don't know what the deal is with that, but yeah, as far as, I, uh, what, what Marco was saying, I would not delete the GMB page and start over. Don't do that. That's going to cause even more problems. Instead, uh, I would go back and like he said, add the additional, any, any categories that the, the business actually fits into, you should add those to your listing in my opinion, because it gives you more opportunity, uh, in the long run to rank. So. God, you guys had some really good questions today. Big ones. Uh, all right, next one. Um, Salman says, hi there. He's a new, I believe he's a new mastermind member. Uh, Thanks in advance for taking the time to answer my question for backlinking package to push life to a recently built branded syndication net network. It says to come up with a minimum of 200 keywords or you can do it for $20, which means we can do it. Uh, if we are to do this, what are the keywords you are looking for? Branded, LSI, money, or all the aforementioned? What is the typical turnaround for a small link building exercise to be complete? Roman, that's a good one for you. Uh, yeah, basically on the uh, keywords, pretty much all of the above with what you just said there. Um, you definitely want to have lots of variation. Yes. Um, and it, kind of think about what you're linking to as well. You know, with it. it, I mean, obviously, I think this is going to a syndication network. So in this case, you know, you you're pushing the brand on the uh, on the syndication network. Yep. You know, if it's a persona, it might be a little little different. Um, as far as the turnaround time, it depends on if you order the the syndication network with it. The syndication network will have to be completed before the link building can actually start. So if you placed an order for both of them. Uh, let's see. The IFTTT networks will, or syndication networks will typically be out in seven to 21 days as a rough range, depending on volume. And it's about the same for the link building as well. So, yeah. cause it takes, it takes time for the link building. You don't want to hit everything at once. No. Yeah. And so think about, remember that guys, he's, he asked specifically about building links to a branded syndication network. So we recommend including branded, uh, you know, um, brand terms for anchors as part of the keywords in that case, in that, um, in this instance. However, if you are building links to a persona network, you don't want to do that. You you could use the persona name that makes sense, right? Because again, you're linking to the syndication network properties of that persona. And a lot of the times that persona ring is going to be like, you know, John Doe dot blogspot dot com, you know, that kind of thing. So John Doe would work or John Doe's blog or something like that. Um, but remember for syndication, yeah, you do want to add some brand terms in there. Okay. Go, go broad as well, guys. Don't go with long tails. I don't personally, I don't like to do like long tail exact match keywords on link building packages to that kind of stuff. It looks a bit funny. I like to go broader. Uh, to where I'm, you know, targeting more the, the kind of like the, the higher level, higher category level of keyword so that I'm not going after like, and what I mean by that guys, if like you're, if you're trying to rank for plumbing services, Atlanta, Georgia, I wouldn't have plumbing services, Atlanta, GA, uh, as one of my keywords. Typically I don't like to do that as much. I would rather have something like plumbing, uh, plumbing services, plumbing repair, more general, more broad type category, uh, keywords. Because uh, you got to think about where those links are being built to. And it just seems funny to go exact match like two and three steps away from your money site, in my opinion. So. And, and if I can just add, Dedia is, is the best yeah. at, at link building. I mean, by far. 
So if you're gonna get, if you're gonna order a, a link building package, get it from Surface guys. Don't, don't don't go to fucktards that don't know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. Yep, Daddy will actually look at the uh, the keywords that you submit and everything and make sure that there's no issues. Yeah. Okay, Salmon says, have you guys heard of using the following JSON-LD schema app? No, I was just looking at that. I'll make a note of that to look at it later. I don't really have time to analyze it right now because we've got other questions, but we will take a look at this and we'll say, um, you know, add it to my our list of stuff. We have the JSON-LD schema generator in um, Surfspace that works well. But by the way, Roman, ping me afterwards. I want to talk to you about adding a field to that. Okay. Um, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I've been definitely. I just the last couple it. days. Yeah, I just made an adjustment to it uh, within the last week to update something that Google had done. So, okay. Yeah, let me know because, uh, or just like I said, just remind me to chat with you afterwards about that because there's a couple um, things I want to chat about. Um, but yeah, it, again, I, I don't have time to look at these right now. But um, Jason LD, it depends. Again, it depends. I've seen significant uh, maps improvements, ranking improvements by just adding. Um, JSON LD structured data, the correct type to the header and removing like bad code. In fact, the, I just picked up a client about two weeks ago and I was working on one of their sites yesterday and they had a plugin that was displaying events in their sidebar that, and it had an option to add JSON LD markup to the events. And he had that option selected. And when I ran it through the structured data testing tool, every single event that was listed threw nothing but errors. <laughs> so it was destroying his structured data markup on the site. And so again, uh, you know, I, I recommend when, when you've got something like that, if it's, if it's incorrect, it can cause problems. So it's better. And it's probably better not to have it at all than to have it incorrect. What do you say, Marco? I absolutely agree. We, we did a, a, a webinar on schema where we talked about having the right kind of schema and that not, not all schema is created equal. And that you can actually put schema on your website that'll hurt your website, right? Especially if if you add uh, what, what do you call it? fake reviews or stars that, that that you're not supposed to have, or if you add to the count on your on your views in, in your YouTube video, for example. Google is really good at picking that up because it's it, it's really measuring one variable, which is what you're showing, versus what you, YouTube is showing. And if it doesn't match up, you're screwed. Same thing with stars, right? They leave reviews, they go check. No, it doesn't add up. You're screwed, and you get a penalty. You've seen it, Bradley. You've seen yep. the, the, the schema penalty. You get it right in Search Console. It's a manual action. Now let let me add that what we have in uh, in Surfspace is the basic things that you need for uh, for schema for your website. Now as we go along, we we will be adding to the tool so that you can do more schema. But it's it's what you need, right? It's 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 the basic stuff. If you want to get deeper into it, go to jasonld.org. I think there's a forward slash somewhere in there, and take a look because there's tons of stuff that you can do in there. I mean, you can get really wicked with it. Yeah. So again, I've seen some significant jumps from just uh, up um, correcting JSONLD or adding it to a site that was a virgin site to begin with. Um, I've seen significant jumps sometimes, but other times I've added it and I've never seen, and didn't see it budge. So there was no way to tell what, it, you know, what kind of effect it had. Um, it, it just add, I guess, to the cumulative effect of everything. Right. So again, it's, it just depends. I'm not sure. Um, I don't have enough experience to figure out like why one would jump more than the other, other than perhaps uh, competition levels for that particular search term. So. Um, okay, that's the last one. And Salmon, just so you know, I know you're a mastermind member, so we'll give you some slack here. <laughs> if you are the same Salmon, um, break up your questions a little bit so that other people can get in. Um, just like if you got more than one question, that's fine. Just allow some other people to post in between if you don't mind. All right, if a company has different locations is trying to rank for and has specific company website pages, would it be possible to use JSON LD local business mark markup in the footer page for these specific city service pages? Yes, you can and you should. Because if you got a local business, uh, like a specific page, a locations page on a website for uh, a business that has multiple locations, then what I recommend that you do is put um, code specific to those landing pages in the header of those pages. And you can use a plugin. It used to be called OH Add Scripts. I think it's called something else now. 
OH add scripts. You can also use Google Tag Manager, which is what I actually recommend that you do now, even over a WordPress plugin. But some people are scared of Tag Manager. Um, but you can use Tag Manager to set code to only display on specific pages. And what I like about Tag Manager is you can swap code in and out from the Google Tag Manager dashboard. You don't have to mess with code on a site at all. I prefer to do that. Uh, so again, Google Tag Manager is your best option in my opinion. But if you want, if you're scared of it uh, or whatever, then you can do, uh, it used to be called OH Ad Scripts. Now it's called SoGo Ad Script to individual pages, header, footer. It's a WordPress plugin. It's a great plugin that you can do to add specific local market um, data, uh, excuse me, local business structured data markup to those individual pages. Keep in mind though, if you're gonna do that, you don't wanna put the organization markup site-wide on, on the root domain. In other words, you don't want that JSONLD markup that uh, you know, marked up for the organization, the, the brand, to be on every page because then it will conflict with the local business page or can conflict. You'd have to check it and validate it. There's a way to use individual locations with organization markup, but it has to be done correctly. And to be honest with you, we just covered this in a mastermind webinar recently, um, or maybe it was an RYS webinar or whatever, uh, that those, um, when, when you try to, there's no definitive answer on how to properly use organization plus local business markup when you've got multi locations. There are multiple versions that will validate in a structured data testing tool. But nobody knows which, uh, no kidding, you can research it yourself, I have. Nobody knows for sure what the exact way is to do. <laughs> so I would recommend if you're gonna be using multi-location like you mentioned, to just put the corporate or the organization markup on uh, perhaps the home page and then on the location, um, the contact page and the about page, and that's it. The rest of the site, I wouldn't even worry about it except for on each individual locations page, you would put that location's local business markup. That makes sense. Okay, guys, we only got a few minutes left. We've got to try to run through it. Ivan says, did any of you guys try to apply YouTube strategies to Facebook videos? Um, I've messed around with some uh, Facebook SEO stuff, but I really didn't mess around too much with it because I wasn't really seeing any results. Does anybody here have any ex experience trying to do like Facebook SEO stuff? I don't hmm, mess sorry. with Facebook much. So. Um uh, the, the only thing that I that I know of, of Facebook SEO is uh, by by trying to rank a, a page, you know, a public page, because I know that Facebook is quite like it's quite restrictive of, of Google bots unless you have a public page where you can use as a parasite. Right. So you can use a Facebook page and you can optimize the URL and the title, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's kind of hard because Facebook is still restrictive of Google bots. You know what I mean? So but what about what I meant like SEO within Facebook search? Oh, within Facebook, yeah, it's usually based on it's usually based on engagement. So when you when you're trying to rank for Facebook search, uh, you Facebook search is usually keyword rich. So you want to type some keywords and on on the page and on uh, whatever post, but it's also based on edge rank, right? So engagement. So usually, yeah. if if you wanna if you wanna push. Uh, if you want to push like um, a page uh, up to the top of, of, of Facebook algorithm or Facebook uh, search engine, what you need to do is to do some PPE campaigns like pay, uh, put, uh, pay per engagement, right? So you get more engagement and the more engagement you, you get for the, for the page and for the, the, the um, whatever you're trying to rank, it's usually rank, ranks better, you know? Okay, there you go, Randy. We're going to get two more real quick, guys, and we're going to wrap it up because we got to get ready for the Syndication Academy webinar. I want to get Randy's and Greg's question. Um, question on internal linking to the homepage. Google only counts the first link to any given page. So when you internally link to the homepage, do you remove the logo link that is usually the first link crawled and the place of contextual link back to? Randy, you, you're, you're, you're correct if you have in, in one respect, but incorrect in another. If you have two links within an article body, the body of a post, right, or a page, whatever, it's, it's called the article body, that section, right? So contextual links, if you have two contextual links to the same page, the same URL, it's only going to count one. But from what I understand, that if they're two different URLs, they'll, they'll count both links, even if they go to the same destination. So you could use like a 301 redirect URL, for example, or a different variation of the URL, like omit dub dub dub, or add dub 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 to it, and it would still 
the, the, you'd still end up getting credit for both links because it's a different URL. If it's the same URL, then you're right. It will only give credit to one, but that doesn't apply to the logo you link. That's different. That's not in the article body, right? That's in a different section of the page altogether. So uh, you're right when you were saying what you were saying, but that homepage link from the logo that's connected to the logo, Google knows what that is. The bots know what that is. They understand the layout of pages and how pages are assembled. So what they're looking for is the article body, the body section of the, the, the page itself. Does that make sense? Does anybody else have any conflicting um, info on that? I've got a small piece. Um, okay. I agreed with everything you said. Um, the one thing I would change maybe is that concept of counts. You know, when he's referring to counts, I'm assuming he means, you know, passing power, juice, whatever you want to call it into the, into the destination page. But the thing to also think about is that <clears throat> it's also anchor text, right? Mm -hmm. So Google is going to count the anchor text as well. So if you have three links into the same destination, it's going to count all three of those towards your anchor text ratios. Yeah. So that's well, another consideration. more... SEO weight than the others, yeah. right? Then it's the first, the very first click. click. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. So That's guys, right. guys, you need to learn to use JavaScript links. You need to learn JavaScript. Fuck Google. <laughs> Enough said. We have seen better results from contextual internal linking, but going back to the home page of either the logo is just better user experience. How do you all build out? Um, yeah, I mean, again, it, it's entirely one of the one thing you can always do is add a call to action at the end of every page. If you want to link back to the home page or every post or w whatever it is, whatever content you want to publish to your site, you can always and, and you probably should be writing a call to action within the post uh, at the end or, or, or somewhere in the post itself that would point back to the home page because, uh, you know, it, it make it, it. First of all, it's a natural way to link back to the home page because you can. You can use the brand name as the anchor text, for example, or a keyword or a service or whatever you want or a click here, a generic, you know, whatever. Um, but also, uh, you know, that way it, it, you if you are using that call to action as an opportunity to also direct the visitor to take an action. You know what I mean? And so that's why I recommend that, um, you know, you do that. If, if I'm linking back and a lot of times I don't always link to the home page. I would from like silo headers, but usually from like within the silos uh, supporting articles or posts. So again, supporting pages or posts, I typically don't link back to the home page, not unless there's a reason to, um, because I usually am trying to keep my silos very, very tight. The, the silo heading pages are the ones that I usually link back to the home page. But again, it just depends. Okay. All right. One last one really quickly. Um, I just want to talk about this. I should be able to wrap this up in about three minutes. Greg says in YouTube Mastery, you mentioned a method of scheduling a live event a week out and then seasoning the video before it even goes live. Could you explain what would you do to get positive metrics during the week or how to season it and have a strong first day published? Well, really, the thing is, is if you get that code, right, the embed code syndicated out across a bunch of properties, Google knows that code's out there. It knows where it's at, how many pages it's embedded on. And so uh, th that in itself used to be enough to where if you were to take a scheduled live event and syndicate it out across network or multiple networks, then when you went live, when the scheduled live event went live, it would, uh, or you'd start the broadcast. It would, it would jump to page one a lot of the times. I mean, even for some really competitive terms, I've I've been able to do that. But over time, uh, you know, Google caught on to all of us spammers out there. So like that stopped working as much. What, what it does still work. But what works better is if you are to embed those, um, you know, on those properties that are embedded, is to get some traffic, uh, get some backlinks and some social signals to the properties that it's embedded on. And that's going to make a big, big difference. If you can get some, um, any one of those backlinks, social signals, and engagement or traffic, excuse me, traffic, because if somebody, there's not really anything to engage on until the, the video is actually broadcasted, right? Somebody lands on the page, it's just a coming soon or this broadcast hasn't started yet or whatever placeholder. But if you can build some backlinks to it so that Google uh, recognizes that the pages that it's embedded on or the posts that it's embedded on is getting some activity, inbound links, uh, likes, plus ones, tweets, um, and then perhaps uh, some traffic. So, so people clicking through and you can use CT spam like CrowdSearch or something like that, for example, to actually provide traffic signals, right? And that then what happens is when you go to hit the broadcast button, um, now you've got 
web pages out there from web twos or whatever that actually have engagement and proper signals that are telling Google, hey, people are waiting for or this this event is got some um, you know activity behind it. it's got some popularity. And so it, it's it's more guys. Remember, YouTube is going just like what we're, uh, Hernan was talking about over here with Ivan about engagement being the number one ranking factor within um, Facebook itself, within Facebook search. YouTube is very much that way now. It's because it's going more and more towards the engagement signals, guys, um, that to rank videos. I've seen videos rank for ex incredibly competitive terms by engagement alone. Right. And that's and that's why. I mean, it makes sense. It's harder to spam engagement. So, uh, the last part of that question that was Holly Cooper, Greg. Holly Cooper, she was the one that uh, had a course about that. <clears throat> all right, guys, we got to wrap it up. Syndication Academy webinar starts in five minutes. We'll see you all over there. Thanks everybody for being here. See you. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.